All right, let's go ahead and get started with our first lecture on statistics. Uh, so we're going to start off by talking about data, and that's really what statistics is. Um, it just it just has to do with data. Uh, we'll define that in a second. Um, but we're going to talk about how to gather data, how to organize data, um, and in the future we'll we'll just sort of uh, continue on with that, and we'll just build on top of this idea of gathering and organizing data. So, right off the bat, uh, definition of data. Um, it's data is, is plural. Um, uh, or it could be singular, but generally when we say it, it's plural. So data, multiple, um, they are measurements or observations that are gathered for an event. So for example, maybe I do an experiment where I'm just flipping a coin. And as I flip this coin, I get heads, and then I get tails, and then I get tails, and then tails, and then heads. And right there, those that would be my data. So for this for this experiment that I'm doing for this event of flipping a coin, if I do it multiple times, the results basically are, are data, and and these are measurements. They're observations. They're things that I'm noting happening. So I, I flip a coin and I note whether I get heads or tails and when I get heads and tails. And so that's that's my data for this experiment. And what statistics is, it says, hey take all this data that you have for your experiment and, and make some conclusions from it, you know, figure out something, something from it. If you flipped a coin enough times um, without even knowing, you know, what a coin actually was, you could probably figure out that, hey, the probability of heads versus tails is 50%. And you could figure that out just by looking at a bunch of coin flips and looking at the data, looking at the results of those coin flips. And that's all that statistics says. It's just saying, hey, look at your data and draw conclusions from it. Um, but unfortunately, that can be kind of tricky, um, and, and we'll we'll see several ways uh, of of that today. So um, let's continue on with some more definitions. So population. So if we if we use the word population, that consists of everything that that's being studied. Um, so so maybe maybe I'm I'm going out and I'm studying people's uh, grocery store habits, you know, maybe what, what people purchase from the grocery store uh, most often. And so the population would be uh, all of the people that go into this grocery store, um, because that's everyone that's being studied. And then a sample is going to be a subset of that population. So what I might say is all of, all of the males between the age of 20 and 30 that go into this grocery store. And now while the population is, is the entirety of everyone who enters the grocery store, a sample of that population might be just um, you know, young adults uh, or, or you know, 20 to 30 year old males that go into the grocery store. And so these samples are, are actually key here because realistically, and let's continue on with this example, this grocery store example. Realistically, you're not going to ask every single person who walks into a grocery store what they've purchased. But what you might be able to do is you might be able to ask certain people. So, so you just ask some of them. But the question is, how can you intelligently ask some of those people so that you actually get a good representation of everyone? So, for example, if you just asked uh, young adults, you know, what they purchased at the grocery store, if you just asked, you know, uh, kids between the age of, of 20 and 30, that's going to give you a lot different, or they're going to give you a lot different answers of what they purchased than, than someone older might have, or, or males might buy something different than a female, um, or, or, you know, uh, single singles might buy different things than, than married uh, couples. And so, how we take this sample, how we figure out who to ask, you know, when we're standing out front of the grocery store and we're asking people what they purchased, who we ask is, 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 a, is, a, is a good question. And, that's, and that basically gives us this idea of how do we sample? How do we come up with the people that we, that we should ask? Um, and so there's a couple different ways we can do this. Um, and and we'll, we'll primarily talk about four of them right now. So what we'll say is that we're gonna take a sample, we're gonna collect a sample. And that's basically just saying with these four ways right here, we're gonna, this is how we're deciding who to ask, you know, hey, what'd you buy from the grocery store? So the first thing that we could do is we could do a random sample and let's go ahead and get into that. So a random sample is just that, it's random. So you've got people walking in and out of this grocery store and as, as they come as they come out of the grocery store, as they leave that store, you're going to ask them, 
at random. You're not going to have any rhyme or reason as to who, as to who you ask. You're just going to ask people very randomly. Um, and so this might be hard to do just if you were an actual person standing there, but maybe, maybe you, maybe you come up, you, you go before with a, with a list of numbers, possibly. Maybe you just have a list of a bunch of random numbers and those are the people in order that you ask. But basically the idea is that the people that you ask, you know, of their grocery store shopping habits in this experiment, in this example that I'm using, uh, it would be chosen, they'd be, everyone would be chosen randomly. One way you could do that is you could number people. So maybe if you, maybe if you were just asking people after the fact and you had a bunch of people in a line, you had a hundred people standing in a line and you wanted to ask them, Hey, how'd you, you know, what'd you buy at the grocery store? You, you could just number them one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to a hundred. And then uh, at that point, you could just randomly pick out numbers and ask those people. So random sampling, that's going to be you just randomly picking each person and every person, each subject of that population has an equal chance of being selected. That's key as well. You can't prioritize any, any person over, over another. And that's random sampling. So let's continue on with systematic sampling. And so in this, in this, uh, type of sampling, what you're going to do is you're going to, you're basically going to choose like every fifth person that enters the, or that leaves the grocery store. So every fifth person, you're just going to ask them, um, you know, Hey, what'd you buy from the grocery store? I'm, you know, I'm collecting data on that. And so what, what you might do is you could say, Hey, we're going to number each member of the population. And then you're just going to choose every kth member in this example, I just used K equals five, I said every fifth member, you could ask every other member, you could ask every 10th member. And so in this grocery store example, you're just saying, hey, every fifth person, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask them. And that's, that isn't quite random, but it might do a good job of giving you a variety of people that you're asking, because there's no rhyme or reason as to who's going to leave on the, on the fifth person and the 10th person and the 15th person. There's not necessarily rhyme or reason there. Um, so this is systematic sampling. This, is, this can be a good way of, of doing sampling. It doesn't have to be good, but it, it could be a good way of doing sampling. All right, so uh, let's continue on with stratified sampling. And so in, in this case here, what we're gonna do is we're going to split the entire population into similar groups. And what I actually want to do is I want to change my example from a grocery store. What I want to do is, is let's, let's consider an example where we are dealing with college students and we're going to survey them on their grades in their math class that they're taking uh, the, in the current semester. So um, with this college, what you could do is you could say, hey, you know what? It would be pretty easy for me to split the entire population of the school. Everybody here that I want to ask. Obviously, there's you know way too many people to ask at the entire college, but I could split them into similar groups. And one way that's that's uh, that's a good you know a good grouping would be freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Maybe if you're at a four-year university. And so if you split that population into those four groups and then chose randomly within each group, we call that stratified sampling. And so I, I, I kind of like to think about this um, as, as basically like a, like a cake or maybe a seven layer dip, um, you might say. So, so let's, let, let's kind of draw this. Let, let's say that we had a seven layer dip right here. And I, I won't make it seven layers, we'll, we'll make it four. So we've got a four layer dip right here. And let's say that, that you decide to, you know, you, 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 you know, you've got this four layer dip and you want to take, you want to take a, a potato chip and you want to, you want to dip into it, you know, and, and get, get every one of these four layers. So when you go ahead and you, and you dip into this, you're going to, you're going to cut off a, a slice of this. You're, you're going to actually take out a chunk of this. Let's let's try and make this look good. Kind of what we're what we're taking out in our chunk. And so what you're noticing here is that I've taken this this dip, right? This this four layer dip. And what I've done is I've I've actually um, and, and and let's go ahead and do this. Let's actually change this coloring to to white 
that'll that'll look a little better. So what we're what we're doing here is we're we're taking this dip and we're actually splitting it into into four parts, right? And so e there's each layer, right? You know, when you've got your seven layer dip, your four layer dip, there's there's all of these all of these different layers that are that are going on in here. And so with that you, that's the splitting this population into your similar groups. But then when you choose from each group, that's, that's you actually just taking a bite out of this four layer dip. And so, so this, this is kind of the, the analogy that I, that I like to use here. We can make this look, look a little nice of a drawing here. And so, so we're, we're cutting out out of this seven layer dip, four layer dip, however many layers you got, but that's, that's an idea of stratified sampling. You could even think of it like a cake that has a bunch of different layers to it. And so you, you trying to get a portion of each of these groups, that's stratified sampling. And then just noting that how you pick from within each of those groups is going to be random. So let's continue on with cluster sampling. And this is very similar in idea to stratified sampling, but then once after it starts off similarly, it deviates quite a bit. Um, so going back to, to this, this four layer dip idea, um, let's say that, that, we were, that we were sampling at a college and we, we, we split everybody into freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, just like we did before. So if you split everybody into those sections, now what I want to do is I want to be, I want to be that guy, you know, at the party who, who just decides, hey, the guacamole is right on the top of this four layer dip. I'm going to just take all of that off. And so what he does is he just, he just gets rid of all the guacamole right on the top. And, and that right there that he's taken off, now it's only a three layer dip. And so this idea here is, is basically just that we're gonna choose a portion of the population. Maybe if we're at a college, we're gonna choose all of the sophomores and then we're gonna sample all of that portion. And that would be cluster sampling. So we use that word cluster because we're splitting everybody into groups and then we're going to take a large cluster uh, and we're gonna sample all of that. So the differences between stratified and cluster sampling are, are that after we split the population into groups, which we do in both of them. So after we split the population into groups in stratified sampling, we choose within each group randomly. And in cluster sampling, we pick one group and we sample all of that. And there are way, there are times and there are reasons that these, each of these can be good or bad. Um, all four of these actually, all four of these sampling methods, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. It really just depends on the situation. Um, and that's something that, that we'll see. Uh, and we'll practice that as well. So let's go ahead and continue on. We've talked about sampling methods. And I want to talk about two different types of statistics. So we're going to have descriptive statistics, and we're also going to have inferential statistics. Um, and so descriptive statistics says, hey, let's take the entire population and let's, let's gather information for everybody and let's state the results. You'll notice that a lot of times this is hard. Um, for example, it, let's say, let's say, you know, in the United States, you're doing the census, you know, the, uh, you know, we, we've got the census, so we're trying to get information on everybody who lives in the United States. Well, it's really tough to ask every single person in the United States, a bunch of information about themselves. And so if we could, that would be descriptive statistics. If we were just to go out and we asked every single person, you know, things about them, you know, hey, what's, you know, what's your age, you know, what's your, what's your favorite color, you know, all those sorts of things, then, and then we just stated those results, that would be descriptive statistics, and we say descriptive because that's exactly what it is, we're, we're talking to everybody, we're talking to every single person that we can, and we're just, that's very descriptive, we're just stating the results as they are. Inferential statistics is really, just all statistics generally. And so what this is, is it says, hey, gather information about just a part of the population, which you determine by sampling. And we've seen a couple ways of sampling on the last couple slides. So look at just part of the population and use that to infer the results for everybody. So 
this is really nice because instead of asking every single person at the grocery store what they purchased, you can just ask some of them and just say, hey, let's kind of just extrapolate this up and say, you know what, we asked some people at the grocery store and we're just going to say that this you know, their answers pretty much work for everybody. But what you got to be careful there is you have to make sure that you choose that the people that you ask carefully. And that's where all that sampling comes in that we talked about. So the types of statistics there, uh, the inferential statistics is, is inherently tied to all of these sampling methods that we've seen. The biggest thing with statistics and doing a survey, actually going out and asking people questions is who do you ask and how do you, how do you figure out who to ask? Uh, your questions. So there is sampling and types of statistics. Um, let's go ahead and talk about how to organize data. So there's a lot of different ways that you can organize data. Um, I couldn't even begin to start talking about all of them. But two that we're going to look at, uh, at, at least for now, uh, we, we will look at more. But for now, we're going we're gonna to look at two, and they're going to be frequency distributions and stem and leaf plots. Um, they have their pros. They have their cons. Some are, or one of these is better than the other in certain cases and worse than the other in others. Um, all of the other ways that you could organize data, sometimes those are better. Uh, but these, these are going to be, these are going to be the ways that we're, we're going to organize our data. And what I want to be clear about is this word organize. Um, we're going to talk more later about how to represent data. And those two words seem to have similar meaning, but I wanna, I wanna make a distinction between them. When I say organize, this is generally for your benefit. This is generally for the benefit of the person who is taking the data down, who's actually at the grocery store and asking these questions. It's smart to organize your data in such a way that you can very easily um, look at it and you know use it basically representing data is going to be, hey, I want to, I want to show the world, you know, my data. And so I'm going to make maybe like a pie chart or a graph or, or a bar graph or something like that. And that shows the world my results. So the difference between organizing data and representing data is subtle, but that difference really lies in the fact that organizing data is you taking all of your data and just writing it down in a way that is easy to look at representing data, as we'll see in the next lecture, that's going to say, hey, how do I get across my results of my data? And so we'll, we'll see that. We'll see that next time in the, in the next lecture. But for now, we're just going to talk about organizing data. So let's say that, that I go out and I actually survey 25 people and I ask them what their blood type is. And I get all these responses. I get an A, I get a B, I get another B, I get an AB, I get a bunch of O's in a row and it keeps going on and I, and I have all of these blood types. This right here is not a terrible way of organizing your data. It's definitely short and concise. It's just a five by five grid. But what would be nice is if I could actually write this in a, in a cleaner way. Maybe instead of, what if instead of 25, what if it was 250 people? Or what if it was 2,500 people? or 25,000 people, then, then our, you know, writing it like this doesn't really suffice. It just doesn't work. That'd just be way too much writing. It would take up way too much space. You couldn't even fit it on a piece of paper. So what we can do is we can do what's called a frequency distribution. And let's, let's break that down, that, that phrase down in each word. So the first word frequency, that's, that's how often something occurs. And then distribution is gonna say, uh, you know, let's think of the root of that distribute we're going to distribute these frequencies across each of the categories that they fall under. So what I notice here is, let, let's go ahead and single out A. So I see an A, an A, an A, an A, and one more A right there. There's five A's right there. So wouldn't it be a lot easier if I just wrote down, hey, there's five A's. And then take a look at AB. Well, AB, 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 and AB, there's four ABs. So instead of writing them all over the place, why not just state that there's four ABs? And this is exactly what we're gonna do. We're just gonna make a table. And this is a frequency distribution right here. We're gonna look at the type, we're gonna list it, and we're gonna say, hey, look, there's five A's, there's seven B's, there's nine O's, and there's four ABs. And this is a great way of just listing, hey, these are all the blood types that we got. Um, and and it, it's a lot cleaner than writing this. And it's especially a lot cleaner if I survey more people. If I were to survey, you know, a thousand people, I don't want to write a grid out that's going to include, you know, all of those people individually. I want to just make a frequency distribution that just tells me how many of each I have. 
And so this is really just a table. It just tells you how often each thing occurs. Um, let's, let's go ahead and look at another example here. And we're actually gonna look at more data. So right here, we're gonna look at the highest recorded temperature in each state in the United States. So there's 50 states here. Um, we, we've got five columns uh, of, of 10. Um, and we've got all of our states here. And you'll notice, uh, actually, interestingly enough, that all of these are 100 or higher. They're all triple digits. And the smallest are Alaska and Hawaii right there. Uh, they're both at 100. And I don't see any other hundreds here. So it seems like that's the smallest. And then the highest is California, 134 degrees. That's in Death Valley. And so so we've got all this data here, and this is great. This is, this is fine, all, all fine and dandy. If we were to make a frequency distribution for this, though, there's a problem that I'm noticing. The problem is that there's not a whole lot of repeating of these numbers. So what I might try and do is I might try and make a table that says, all right, so we've got, the, we've got 100 degrees. And let's go back here and let's say, oh, there's a 100 and there's a 100. All right, so there's two of them. And then let's look at 101 degrees. And then let's look at 102 degrees. And then let's look at 103 degrees. And what you'll notice is that, as I, as I mentioned, there's not a whole lot of repeating here. I mean, when I look here at, at for 101, I, I don't even see any 101 right here. I don't even see any 102 either. Um, and so going down this list here, it just doesn't seem super clean and super, super viable because we don't even have every number in it. And also I don't wanna make a table that's 50, 50 uh, rows long, right? We're, we're gonna go all the way up to, I think that highest temperature was, was 134. I don't, or I don't wanna make a table that's, that's 34, 35 rows long. That's just, that's just too much. So what we could do instead is we can actually split our temperatures instead of just using single numbers, we can use ranges. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, all right, looking back at that table before, we, we have three states that fall in the range of 100 to 104. We have eight states that fall into the range of 105 to 109. We have 16 states that fall in the range of 110 and 114. Uh, and then so on and so forth. And so um, with, with all that there, this is a frequency distribution, but, but really what we've done here is, is we've, we've given ourselves the, the ability to make a very clean and concise table without having to just write all of those temperatures down. And obviously we lose a little bit of the data. You know, we, we lose a little bit of interpretation here. We don't know exactly where these 16 fall in that range, but it's a range. So, you know, we know that they're at, at worst 110 and at best 114 for this range right here. So we've got that right there. This is a, this is a frequency distribution. We're gonna look at this more later in the next lecture, but uh, for now, we'll go ahead and stop that there. Let's go ahead and move on to a stem and leaf plot. So here, what I want to do is I want to look at the average gas prices in cents from 1980 to 1999. You'll notice how small these are. Um, and uh, they're, they're pretty, pretty low gas prices. So we've got all these gas prices. And like we've said, this is a nice clean and concise list, but that's really just because we're only looking at 20 pieces of data here. If we were looking for a lot more years or over a longer time span, or maybe we went by per month um, over all these years, we just have way too much data to write out as a big, ugly table. So what we could do, we could do a frequency distribution, but um, in this case, we're going to do a stem and leaf plot in this example. And what I'm going to notice here is I'm going to notice the first digit or the first two digits. So you'll notice there's a couple of these that only have two digits. So what I'm gonna look at is, and I'll actually go ahead and circle these or I'll box these, eight, nine, nine, I'm gonna look at 10, 11, 11. So I'm gonna look at these first two digits here. And what I notice is that they're always eight, nine, 10, 11, uh, 12 or 13. 
Yeah, we got a we got a 13 right in there. So I'm gonna look at those first two digits right there. And I'm gonna I'm gonna make a table that has all of those digits on the left hand side. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna call those the stems. So you'll notice I've got my eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, all right, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and get rid of all this. Let's let's just look at the at the data that have those stems. So that where the first two digits were one and zero. So let's look at this. Let's look at this right here. Let's look at that. And actually that's it. Those are the only ones that start with a one zero. What they finish with is a zero and a six. So what I do here is I write my stem of one zero and then I write my leaf of zero and six. And so really how I'm reading this is I'm saying, hey, look, this is a hundred. And then I also have a data point that's 106. Right here, I say, hey, here's a data point that's 90. And then here's a data point that's 90. Here's a data point that's 86. Here's a data point that's 131. Here's a data point that's 122. Here's a data point that's, oh, here's a data point that's 123 right there. And if you go back here, you'll notice all of those in there. There's a couple of those 123s. There's a 122 right there. And my 100 and 106 right there, that's just listed right there, 100 and 106. And so this stem and leaf plot, basically in this case, it's just showing us, um, it, it's, it's just showing us, you know, hey, here are the first digits and here are the last digits. We could do a different example where maybe we were dealing with, um, maybe you were dealing with software versions. Maybe you have like, you know, software that's 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and then it upgrades to 2.1, 2.2, and then it upgrades to 3.1, 3.2. And you could use your stem and leaves be looking on either side of that, that point, either side of that decimal there. So there's a whole lot of different scenarios in which you could use a stem and leaf plot. This is just one of them. What I do want to mention though, is that this right here looks pretty ugly. These are all out of order. It actually turns out that just based on how, how I've uh, written all this out, these all happen to be in order here. But this, this uh, row right here, this is all out of order. So what we always want to do on a stem and leaf plot is we want to, we want to write it in order. So, so we write it from decreasing to increasing from smallest to largest. So um, go ahead and sort those when you can. Um, and that's going to be our stem and leaf plot. So uh, stem and leaf plots and frequency distributions, uh, some, sometimes it's better to use one or the other. Sometimes it's better to use something even completely different um, than either of these. Um, but, but, but we'll mostly focus on these two. We'll come back and look at these uh, a little bit more in future lectures. But for now, uh, that'll be it on gathering data, uh, sampling and all that, and organizing our data with frequency distributions and uh, stem and leaf plots.